Hopefully I don't blow this up. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for attending the session. Um, for those who don't know, this is um, environmental data, a resource to develop and manage. Um, the idea behind this session was to, um, we have a lot of digital um, networks going forward. Everybody's trying to figure out what to do with their data. And so this session was born based on that. Our first presenter is uh, Carrie Wesh, I'm gonna say it wrong, Wexel. Okay. <laughs> she is an air quality professional and licensed professional engineer with over seven years of experience as a assistant project manager Civil and Environmental Consultants, Inc. in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. She supports clients, air quality permitting and compliance needs in mining, manufacturing, and other industries across the country. Thank you. Um, like she said, my name is Carrie Weixel. I am with Civil and Environmental Consultants in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And today I'm going to be talking about how to manage data for efficient and accurate reporting using um, a document called the Greenhouse Gas Reporting Protocol. Oops, sorry. There we go. Um, sorry, can I just <laughs> yes, of course. Um, one of the rules of SME is there's no photographs uh, unless you have the permission of the speaker. Thank you. Um, so today I'm going to go through a little bit about what environmental data I'm talking about that we're trying to manage here. Um, the greenhouse gas protocol and corporate standard that I mentioned, which is a good framework to show some good concepts to follow for your reporting. Um, those concepts are these accounting and reporting principles, relevance, completeness, consistency, transparency, and accuracy. And then I'll go through a raw data selection example of kind of how to apply these principles. So as far as environmental reporting, what I'm talking about is if you're doing a lot of environmental reporting, what you might be in the throes of right now. Um, we have EPA EPCR reporting that includes tier twos, uh, TRIs. We have EPA mandatory greenhouse gas reporting for coal mining, for example, that's subpart FF. Those are due at the end of March. <laughs> You might have state inventories that are due this time of year. And then there's a lot of benchmark sustainability reports, um, corporate responsibility reports, all voluntary programs that also use a lot of the same data. Uh, and all of this data you're collecting, you're reporting, it's really important to know where it goes. Um, so you know how important it is, you know who might see it, it might help impress upon how important it is that it is accurate, that it is complete. Um, so obviously it goes to whoever you're submitting it to, your regulators, the organizations, if it's a voluntary organization, whatever that is. Um, it might include some confidential information that hopefully you flagged as confidential. And it might get blinded if it's putting it into a, like a benchmarking survey. If you send it to a private company, sometimes they'll blind data so you can get a better idea of the industry. But keep in mind that anything that you submit, especially to the federal government, tends to become public for anyone willing to look. So that's people, your peers, your consultants that you hire to do reporting might go and look up what you've reported in the past as kind of a sanity check. It includes uh, non-governmental organizations, Sierra Club. It includes the media who might not even know what they're looking for or looking at, and that can be kind of dangerous <laughs> for investigative reporting. Uh, your stockholders, of course, and anyone willing to put in a FOIA request. Um, if you wait enough time and put enough paperwork, you can find out a lot of information. Um, and so anything that you've reported, unless you've just, excuse me, explicitly said that it's confidential, just keep in mind that it might be public. Um, and these organizations or people might be looking at multiple sets of your data and comparing them against one another. So just to give you an example of how easy it is to get this data, if you try to go online, there are a lot of websites that will just publish 
almost any data that gets reported. The greenhouse gas data is really easy to get. It's got some really cool graphics, super useful. <laughs> um, there's national emission inventory data. There's TRI data available. You can pay for corporate responsibility report data. There's even international data from Canada or this Center for PRTR data, which is essentially TRI data around the world. So if you want it, you can get it, and that's really important to keep in mind. The problem here is that you're reporting all of this data to all of these reports. It's usually all within a month, and you're frantically trying to put it together. <laughs> and they have different scopes. They have different definitions. They have different calculation methods, different exclusions of what has to be included, what shouldn't be included. And oftentimes, there's different people or departments that are completing these reports. You might have operations doing one report, environmental doing another, safety doing another. So the gathering of the data and calculating the data is going in a million different directions by a million different people. And anytime that happens, you're going to get different answers. Um, and that can become a problem when people are looking for your data and they find different answers. One way to help this process along and make it go smoother for yourself, make it more accurate, is the greenhouse gas reporting protocol. And this doesn't necessarily just apply to greenhouse gases. It's a fundamental how to principles to apply to your reporting process that you can use in any reporting program. This one in particular was put together by the World Resources Institute and World Business Council for Sustainable Development. It was first published in 2001, and it's a standard framework for greenhouse gas reporting. It is available online for anyone to read. And in 2016, 92% of Fortune 500 companies used it in their carbon disclosure project greenhouse gas reporting protocol. So it's well used, it's well established, um, it's a very long document, <laughs> um, but it's got a really great principle set of things to follow. So like I said, it's designed to standardize corporate level greenhouse gas emission inventory. You can find it online. Um, and it includes five key reporting principles. These are relevance, completeness, consistency, transparency, and accuracy. And I'll go through each of them and what they mean by each of those in a minute. Um, but also, as I mentioned, this is not just for greenhouse gases. These principles can be used in any environmental reporting. And I would encourage everyone to use them in all of their environmental reporting and try and do all of your reporting or think about all of your reporting at once so that you can leverage one for another and not duplicate your efforts. So the first principle here is relevance. And relevance in this case means useful. So don't just collect data to collect data. Collect data that you need, that matters. Um, keep in mind that different reports will have different reporting boundaries. And boundaries might be, do you operate it or not? Or do you have any ownership over it? Or does your regulator define your boundaries very specifically? I mean, the EPA has very, very strict definitions of adjacent that are always changing. And it's important to keep things like that in mind when you're talking about relevance. Do you care about your fence line or your property boundary or something like that? And to make these, the data that you're collecting available to all of your reporting programs, it's important to keep them all in mind and pick the broadest definition so that you can use that data for everything and that you don't have to go back and ask whoever is providing that data to you, oh, and also I need this and also this. If you collect everything you need at the beginning, that will help you along the way. So completeness here means comprehensive and meaningful. Similar to relevance, whatever is important, um, but it's every emission source that you have. So again, when you have multiple reporting programs, the greenhouse gas program might say anything that combusts things. Your emission inventory might say anything in your permit. Collect everything, and then you have it available. So that's complete. Um, this is where your programs have different de minimis limits. Um, some of those de minimis limits can actually be pretty big, can add up to a lot. If you're Going through the effort to calculate if it's de minimis, you've already done most of the work. So keep that in mind and keep records of that, even if it's an estimate, just so you have a number on hand that you can prove that it's de minimis. But don't just throw it out as de minimis. Um, that's my caveat there. The next one here is consistency. Um, this is 
essential for trying to do comparisons or aggregate data together, especially outside of reporting programs. If you just want to benchmark against yourself, track year to year, if you're not consistent, those are meaningless. So it's important to be consistent year to year, facility to facility, report to report. Um, and this is honestly the biggest challenge you have when you're working with multiple reports because sometimes you can't be consistent. Some reports have very strict rules while other reports have different very strict rules and you just can't report the same number. And that's okay as long as you understand that. But if you can report the same number, you should so that you can compare report to report. Uh, something else with consistency is basing all of your variations of the same number on one base value that you convert. Don't start with a brand new equation just because you need long tons versus short tons. Just take your number that you've decided is the best number you have and convert it. And that way you can compare again. Um, that's a, a big problem we see a lot. <laughs> Uh, next up, we have transparency, and this comes down to document everything. Write it down so that everyone knows where you got the number, how you got it. Write down your standard operating procedures, your monitoring plans, um, any calculation method you used, who gave you the data so you can get it next year. Um, this will allow you to be consistent. It'll allow you to be complete. And as you write it all down and find that every single number you have comes from a different person, you might be able to evaluate some better options. It really forces you to think. This is also essential for internal or external audits. Um, if you didn't write it down, it didn't happen in a lot of cases, so that's important. Um, and again, it's really important to be, to be able to be consistent if a new personnel comes in, a new facility comes in. If you have a new employee that says, well, how do we do this? You tell them how, and they say, well, how would I have known that? You say, well, that's just how I've done it. That's a terrible answer and not going to help your new employee and not going to help it be the same next year if you leave. And last but definitely not least is, of course, accuracy. If you're doing all of this and your number is wrong, that's not very useful. So the definition within this greenhouse gas protocol is sufficiently precise or the best available. It's not the absolute perfect number because that might be impossible to get. Um, you need to get to where you need to be within reasonable accuracy, uh, but don't spend 25 hours trying to get one extra decimal if the agencies aren't gonna even ask for that. Um, this is where raw data calculation methods, missing data procedures might be prescribed by your reporting program but if you use the strictest requirement, it's usually accepted across all of them. And it, then you could have a consistent single number. It's really important to keep in mind that there are many ways to get a single data point, a single number, and some are much better than others. A lot of people could get to an answer, um, but if you spend the time ahead of time thinking about which way is the best approach, it will help you in the long run. Um, and stop your scramble in March or April whenever your reports are due. So when we're doing raw data selection, using these principles, like I said, your methods and how you get to your final answer might be prescribed, but you usually have a little more flexibility with when you're picking that very raw data, your throughput number, where do you get it, who do you ask? And this is where these principles are especially valuable, to be consistent accurate and document everything where you got it. Um, choosing data that meets the needs of every reporting program you have, convert instead of asking for numbers in different units, and choosing the most accurate data you have available. So if you have a meter versus some guy went out and looked at the belt and thinks he knows what it is, there's definitely better answers there. So if you're looking at the best way to start is to collect all the numbers you possibly have, and then you can pick which one is best among them. And if you're going through the hierarchy of what data is best, the best numbers you have are anything that was previously reported and certified. Um, someone has already seen that number, it's public. Use it again, be consistent if you can. Also, invoice data or sales data, anything that has a money value attached to it is highly scrutinized and probably pretty accurate. Um, your gas bill, for instance, is a very accurate number for your sake and your supplier's sake. After that, meters, lab analysis, and then maybe site-specific values, site-specific assumptions. 
After that, you have industry-specific assumptions, and then finally, general assumptions, emission factors, best engineering judgment, that kind of catch-all of a, a guess. That's educated guess. So now a, a quick example. Um, so say you need to collect some data. Start with what do I need to report it to? Um, so say we need MSHA quarterly methane emission reports. We need EPA greenhouse gas reports and state or local programs. This is all for like a mine ventilation example. So you have methane coming out of the mine. All sorts of people want to know exactly how much is coming out. So you have all of these reports. And then the next step would be figure out where they overlap. Um, so our MSHA reports, the agency comes out and takes a sample. There's not much you can do about that. Um, the EPA says you could take your own samples, you could use the MSHA samples, or you could have continuous emission monitoring system, which would be more accurate than all of these other ones. <laughs> and then finally we decide, and then we write down what we decided and why, so that when we reevaluate re it, excuse me, people can decide if they agree with you or change. In this case, I would say, and I typically use for my greenhouse gas reports, I use the MSHA data because it was already reported, it's consistent, that's an approved method, and I'm not duplicating any work. Um, the caveat there is that if you use facility sample data, it might be a little more consistent because if you looked at MSHA reports, sometimes they decide to change the name of a mine shaft every quarter they come out, and it's kind of hard to follow. Whereas if you did your own sampling plan, you might be able to make it a little more streamlined, but then it wouldn't be consistent. So these are all things you would have to weigh. Um, and that, I guess the point is here, it's not a one size fits all. You can't always say use one or the other. That's why these programs all have options. It's something that you need to evaluate with your team, again, ahead of time, not in March when it's all due, but when you have time to think about where you could get the best data and who to get it from. So in summary, um, environmental data is reported in a lot of ways to a lot of agencies, to a lot of entities, and the principles of this greenhouse gas reporting program can help you streamline and standardize your data. Those, again, were relevance, completeness, consistency, transparency, and accuracy, and they're especially important when you're planning, um, not as much when you're doing, but when you're planning. Uh, and using these can, for raw data selection especially, can make your end results that you are more confident in, and they can really streamline and stop duplicating your effort. So with that, this is my contact information, or you can reach out to me, and I'd be happy to take a few minutes of questions. Thank you. said you were collecting, you know, collect everything, right? Does that you have. have collect, that, yeah. That you have available. Available to you. Do mm -hmm. you find um, that you have more data than you really need? Yes. Okay. I find that when, um, as a consultant, we get pulled in, usually late in the game, um, say now when your reports are due at the end of the month sort of thing, um, and we ask, okay, well, what do you have? Let's look through, do you have meters? Do you have just operations data? Do you have total fuel gas meters versus site specific versus per unit? And they've got all of them. And if you try and reconcile them, they don't match, which makes sense. I mean, some of those meters are calibrated, some are not. Some are meant to be just process meters. Um, and you just kind of have to decide which one's best. Um, people will ask, well, which one's right? And it, it might be none of them if they're not all calibrated perfect meters. You just have to pick the one that fits, and that's why it's important to do it ahead of time and not in the moment, because then you'll pick what's available and the quickest and not necessarily the best. Any other questions? Yeah. How do you recommend uh, your review process goes, especially when you're reporting similar numbers for emission units or sources um, from the federal level for a GHG mm -hmm. report? So we, when we can, we try and compare them as best we can. It's really hard, especially with the federal and state ones, because the scopes are very different. Um, the federal uh, report, especially, 
the combustion equipment, if you have major combustion equipment, it's, there are no de minimis sources, it's everything. If you are applicable, and they're in different units, they're in metric tons, not short tons, they only include certain greenhouse gases, um, and it can be really hard to compare the two. And so anytime you do compare them, when we would share those with other people, we would have to make sure to write up a, a slide of, by the way, this is why these two numbers don't match. I think that's the important part is understanding that they might not match, but knowing why. It's, it's never a good answer to say, oh, it might be rounding error. That's, no one wants that answer. You really want to know, well, this one is going to be higher because it includes other things. Or this one, we were forced to use this emission factor, which we don't agree with, so we don't use it in our state report. Um, so just knowing that why is important, but really getting them into the same units and trying to compare apples to apples is the important part. But that's oftentimes not really possible. <laughs> so. Thank you. Uh, our next talk, um, we have two speakers, um, Austin Jones, um, graduated from the University of Arizona College of Engineering with a focus of mining engineering and mineral processing. Um, he currently is the manager of waste programs for Freeport McMoran and serves as a project sponsor and subject matter expert for the environmental software project. Rodrigo Guzman Sanchez um, graduated from the University of Chicago, Harris School of Public Policy with a focus on technology policy and a background in governmental technology, cybersecurity, and mining consulting. Currently, he's a member of Arcadis, information-driven performance team, and plays a lead role in the Freeport McMoran implementation project. Thank you. First. I'm ready to go. Yeah. All right, good deal. And, and thank you. So the reason uh, we have two presenters, right, is it, it, we're in the midst of implementing a software uh, solution, a, a project right now. And so I'm going to provide essentially the company perspective, the why we're doing what we're doing and, and, and a little bit of how we're doing it. And then Rodrigo is going to talk a little bit about from the implementing partner, the consulting side, kind of the work that's gone on there. And so really, you know, I'd like to say thank you to Carrie and Emma, right? They really teed up, I think, the conversation, right, that we're getting ready to have. And so, you know, you can see why, why was Freeport doing this, right? So this has been uh, essentially a three or four year project for us. It started several years ago, really uh, through an initiative from you know, our site folks, our site environmental managers. They said, hey, look, we're, we're struggling with the tools we have available to us to manage our environmental data. We, we need better solutions, right? It's the digital age, we need, we need to be more modern. And so um, that really kind of pushed us to, to start looking at the, the solutions we had out there um, and, and look for really a fix to our environmental management uh, of, of data, right? And look for really better solutions. And so really kind of the stage for us, we have, you know, 50 plus sites. Now that, you know, includes certainly our operating sites, but also our discontinued operations, our remediation facilities, and really a challenge from, from our perspective as we try to implement this is developing a solution uh, that, that solve really the needs for both our domestic operations as well as accounted for the needs of our international facilities, right? So, so we're really trying to accommodate a wide uh, universe of folks with a lot of kind of different data management needs. Um, our historical uh, environmental data solutions have been really site-driven initiatives, so custom spreadsheets managed by an individual who knew all the emissions factors and site-specific information, right? Or, or we had solution providers, right, that would um, come and customize very specific site data requests, right? And so then when it came time to get that roll up to a corporate reporting initiative or something like that, we were dealing with data that was maybe different because of the way each site had maybe handled their, their data um, differently. We also, from an environmental perspective, didn't have a dedicated resource uh, from a corporate perspective, kind of administer and manage the software solutions that we had. So each site had their own kind of custom solution. Each site was really responsible for administering, maintaining, and managing that individually. Um, you can imagine that certainly led to cost, but it also really presented some challenges with how we manage our overall um, environmental data. Uh, the, the person who was kind of doing this was doing it in their you know, spare time, they had a regular, an, a, you know, a, a regular job, and, and so any kind of software administration was, was really happening um, on the side. 
you know, you talked about kind of corporate roll-up of data. Ours was very siloed, right, between maybe the environmental team and our operations and maintenance teams, or certainly from site to site, we had, we had siloed, siloed data. And so that really prevented us from leveraging and, and using the data from, from one site to, to, you know, help us make better and more informed decisions at our other sites without really lots of manual effort, right? Can, re, the data requests going out, the the management of that data into the format that we had asked for, you know, and the communication up and then back down the chain to those other sites. Um, so, so, you know, that really sums it up. We had very complicated data management. We talked already, it's expensive to manage that many different software solutions across that many sites. So that's kind of where we were. Our, our, like I said, our site environmental manager said, help, we need to do something different. And so really embarked on a project to, to, to improve that. Um, and so, so what we said, what does it have to be, right? Certainly has to be an enterprise-wide software solution. We talked about a little bit about the corporate sustainability reporting, which is kind of all of your environmental data, right? And so this had to be a solution that really fit for all of our sites that would allow us to then roll that data up into the variety of different things and arenas we had to report that data. Uh, we talked a little bit about security earlier, right? And so, so that was, you know, I think a, a, an obvious one, but certainly in today's day and age of, you know, uh, corporate espionage and, and hacking and the ransoming of, of data and, and, and employee and co uh, company information, uh, the solution had to be secure. Um, we, we want it to be integrated, right? So, you know, we're looking and speaking today specifically about uh, an environmental data management solution, but really, you know, the, the, the team said, hey, we'd like it for it to integrate with health and safety. We'd like for it to integrate with some of the other risk management programs we have out there, like our RCA process or our tailing stewardship process. And so wanted it to be integrated so that we had kind of one software solution. And so, um, you know, that was kind of a design consideration as we evaluated and selected software. And then expandable, so we're gonna talk today um, in terms of how we approach this. We're biting off, you know, a relatively small chunk of the apple, so to speak, as we start this project. We started with um, compliance and waste modules, but wanted to be able to tack on water and air quality and corporate sustainability reporting and RCA and kind of the list goes on of what, what you can imagine those software solutions can do. And then, you know, we wanted it to be sustainable, right? So, so we talked a little bit about when, you know, this guy leaves, who's kind of picking up the process? Do we have a repeatable system in place that, you know, um, as we transition employees or as our employees move from site to site to site, you know, can they, does it look and feel the same? Can they pick it up and use it immediately? Can we reduce that learning curve of the software we use to manage data and ensure that we've got really an efficient workforce in terms of uh, getting them out in the field and doing what they need to be rather than having to manage and manipulate spreadsheets. And so those are the kind of things that we, we said any so solution we, we're going to uh, design, they, they have to do these things. So really, again, kind of for us, we, we identified really some key opportunities. Part of that was standardization of the process across all of our sites. We saw that, you know, if we brought this into a single corporate managed process, we had certainly the opportunity to, to reduce cost. Each site, you know, previously was out managing individual licensees, and so bringing that into a centrally managed program uh, uh, had the uh, cost reduction benefit, as well as, you know, we had a lot of time tied up into data entry, data management, et cetera, in the field. And so by improving kind of the, the handling of that data by our team, um, we certainly had the, the elimination of redundancies as well as a, a cost benefit for us. And, and then one of the things that, that we did throughout the course of this project that I think has really benefited us, and, and I should mention, we're getting ready to flip the switch and go live with our solution uh, next week, right? March 2nd, it'll be turned on. And so we're excited about that. But, but we had end users, right? The folks at the sites who have to use the software. We had them in, engaged in one, defining the problem, but in, in designing the system and in, in engaging with our team in terms of, you know, selecting a variety of, or evaluating the variety of different software packages that are out there. Once a decision was made, they were engaged in the day in, day out kind of work with the, the uh, team from Arcadis. What does this form need to look like? What does our business process, how, how does it work? And, and so we were able to design, I think, uh, at least in compliance and waste management thus far, a solution that's really tailored to what our team does on a day in and day out basis, and, and hopefully really kind of um, build that user adoption and buy-in from the end users since they were stakeholders from day one. 
Um, with that, I'll turn it over to Rodrigo, let him talk a little bit about the implementation side from the consultant's perspective. Thank you, sir. Yeah, so I'm gonna talk more about, from the consulting side, what we saw as a challenge when we were starting this process. And these are not unique to Freeport. We see these kind of throughout industries and throughout spaces as people try and move away from this diversified hodgepodge of systems that have kind of organically developed into a more centralized, thought out, designed approach. So one of the first things that we, that we always address is data migration and retention, right? Regulatory compliance has changed over the years and required more and more data to be retained over longer periods of time in different ways. So centralizing that data, understanding what that data is, and then being able to manage it, right? What do we do with it? So many people have data in file cabinets and hard drives, but no one knows what it is. So getting it out there and managing it is, is, is very important to building in like a next generation EMIS. And EMIS, by the way, stands for Environmental, Ma Environmental Management Information System. So just we'll throw that around a couple times. Then dealing with legacy systems and practices, right? We have a lot of this, well, why do you do it that way? Oh, well, because we've always, done, we've always done it that way. Well, why? I don't know, because we just do. Breaking, those, breaking those, those, those assumptions down is key to designing a system that A, is, is, is integrated, but also B, produces good data and produces good outcomes for the staff. No one likes to just have redundancies because they've always had them, right? But a lot of people don't question them, which makes sense. So part of the consultant side of this is asking those questions, and that's why we wanted our users involved from day one, so we could get their information, get their real life experience into these systems. And then historic issues with end user adoption, right? We've all seen who knows how many systems that get rolled out, and nobody uses them because nobody heard they were coming, nobody was involved, whatever the case may be, no matter how good the system is, if nobody uses it, it's useless, right? So get, making sure that we get that integration with the end user, the system, and adoption is critical. And then lack of reporting functionality. It's not uncommon to see data, not only siloed and kind of you know lost, but there's no functionality for creating reports that are meaningful for the organization out of that data. Data reporting is key to making this valuable, right? Who cares if you have 60 terabytes of data if you can't do anything with it? It's meaningless. And then finally, uh, difficulty administering uh, prior systems is something that, again, like, like Austin was saying, without a centralized focal who, who, whose entire job at the organization is to think about how do I administer this, it falls to other people. It's like, oh, I'm also the line manager and they gave me the system job, right? I'm whatever, I run the stacker and I do this. Like, that's not good enough anymore. These aren't like little itty bitty systems. These are huge multinational, multi-regulatory systems that require a dedicated person. So all of that was kind of cooked into the way we started designing this. The things that we've seen that drive success, not only uh, for Freeport, but for a host of other clients, but has been specifically successful here, is a comprehensive initial roadmap. Like, building out this thing in phases. What are we gonna do in phase one? What pieces are we gonna attack? Why? How soon can we get them out to the end users? How soon can we test them? How soon can we roll them over and then make them go live? Right, so all of that was planned out from the start. And it was planned out in conjunction with the Freeport core team and with the end users. And this, this kind of rolls right into broad stakeholder engagement, right? We make sure that our users not only get to see it at the start, they get to see it as it's growing, they get to criticize it, they get to see the iterations, and they get to do it again, right? We involve the team all the way throughout, and it was invaluable to creating a solution that at the end, they actually will use, and that they actually understand. Uh, we applied uh, a bit of an agile-driven approach. It's not exactly agile for those of, us, those of you who are familiar with software development, but it, it's still based in the same kind of create, test, iterate, create, test, iterate, right? We create something, we put it in front of the users, they test it, they break it, it works, whatever, we iterate, and then we move on, right? The goal is to produce a software that is usable, not simply, oh, I have this design, here it is, right? No, nobody cares, right? Give me something that works. And so that's, that's why that approach is, 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 is our um, kind of our core of how we built this. And then coordinated communications, uh, outreach, and corporate champions are also super important because they play into the adoption thing, right? If you don't understand what system is coming, if you don't know how it's gonna affect you, if you don't know when it's coming, 
it makes it very hard to be even excited about it, but it also makes it very hard to even adopt in the first place. You just see it as something else that somebody at corporate is sending you to do. Whereas we want them to be like, no, this is something that's going to make your job easier, it's going to make it better, and it's going to make sure that your organization functions more smoothly overall, right? I want reporting to look the same in Arizona as it is in, I don't know, Texas as it is in Malaysia, whatever it is, I want the process to look as similar as it can. Because also when my people move around in my organization, then they are easily slotted into whatever the next job function is. And so part of this, this agile process were these design workshops. We worked very closely with both the Freeport core team and the extended team in these workshops to bring them together and say, okay, this is what we've got. This is how it should work. Go and see if it does. And tell me if it doesn't. The sprint cycles, again, we talked about were focused on achieving limited uh, attainable goals. We weren't going for reinventing the wheel every cycle, no. Does this form work? Can you do your job with it? Okay, cool, done. What about the next one, right? Did it break the last form? All of these things are limited, but they're part of going to this March 2nd deadline of a product that is usable today, not five years from now, not with you know, a bunch of more consulting, no. And somebody asked earlier, well, don't you, doesn't it reduce their dependence on you? My answer is like, yeah, I hope so. I don't want them to need me, right? I don't, need, I don't want Freeport to have me as the one administering their, their program in six years, right? No, they need to be able to do it, and they have, right? Because they've been part of the whole system or part of the whole process of design, they are ready, right? And they know what questions to ask, and they understand what's happening, and they only need me you know, intermittently now, which is fantastic, right? Because that's, that's a, the proof that they've succeeded in, in, in developing this tool. Targeted end user, end user engagement we talked about, and then feedback, right? Feedback, feedback, feedback. This is so important for building successful solutions, is he listening to the end user, right? It doesn't matter how good I think it is. I'm not the one who's going to use it. If I understand it, who cares? If they don't, we have a problem. So making sure that they're good with it, and even, you know, accepting if this is something that, no, at, you know, the 11th hour, I can't do my job, I'm not going to be like, mm -hmm, whatever, you know, I'm delivering it, goodbye. No, it's, this is still a problem, right? They still need to go back and deal with it. So thankfully we haven't had that happen, but we're always open to this feedback because it makes the system better. And that's all we've got. Yeah. Questions? So in the system that we uh, uh, implemented at Freeport, uh, it's Enablon. So we use Enablon, and Enablon takes all the data, compiles it all, and it has a very powerful, as a matter of fact, I, I believe it's one of the most powerful tools of the system, is a reporting tool that not only allows me to create reports on demand, custom reports, out-of-the-box reports, it also allows me to share them. So if Austin creates a report, he literally can share it to anybody he wants, and they can go in and simply change their site. They can pick their site from the list, stick their site into the, the slot, and they'll get the exact same report for their site. So, and it's all real time, right? I don't ever have to worry about like, oh, is my report up to date? It's always up to date. The moment you click on that thing, it will run a up-to-date live report of whatever it is you're, you're doing, and that maximizes the, the possibilities of me seeing the same thing as people somewhere else. So there's no, there's no mistakes. And I can push those to dashboards, I can deliver those to people's email, and no one, people don't even need to log into the system to get them. I'll just speak really quickly on that question. <clears throat> you know, so in the waste world, right, we've got global reporting initiative that we report waste metric data to. We've got the biennial report, which is due every three years domestically, and then we've got TRI, right? And so we designed our system so that um, where you do a material characterization, you can kind of identify all those different categories. You can enter the totals throughout the year, and then run some of these stock reports at the end of the year. And, and if the data is needed for this program, you know, it's sliced this way. If it's needed for that program, it's sliced that way, right? And, and so really, we tried to solve some of that up front so that end, end users would just be responsible for, in the waste world, for instance, data entry on, you know, the transaction of waste disposal over the course of time. Yeah, they can focus on that. Well, 
We do, um, and, and I would say some of that's evolving and it'll continue to evolve. We're, we mentioned we're doing this in phases. Um, the next phase of work that we're getting ready to uh, take on is our water quality program. And so we're, we've got, we're building and designing into that the QAQC as data comes in from say lab reports, et cetera. So um, I think that QAQC process looks slightly different depending on maybe which module we're talking about, but we're trying to standardize and automate essentially as much of those kind of QAQC functionality uh, um, processes as we can uh, as, as data gets loaded into the system. I don't work for an A-block. <laughs> you know, we, we did, so that, I mentioned we started in 2017. Uh, really, we spent 2018 doing that, looking at what's out there, what's the best. It, it, we hired Arcadis to help navigate us through that as kind of an implementation partner. So some of that was, what can we do in-house? Uh, what are the off-the-shelf kind of solutions that are out there? And, and what are the range of software kind of thing or programs we're trying to solve with this software solution? Uh, we settled on Enablon mostly because it met probably 90% of the off-the-shelf kind of things that we do. And, and there are some specific stuff that through the design and, and, and build of this that we configure to our process to, to, you know, to build in our international site needs, for instance, or you know, really a lot of the work has been on data migration. So, so we've, you know, we really went for that off the shelf, but then that you could configure depending on your specific business process. And, and the goal being, you know, kind of in the last couple of seconds we have, is that I don't want to super customize a system ever because it's not, it's not sustainable, right? Then, then I have to dedicate someone to do that for the rest of their existence, right? And if that guy gets hit by a bus, all of a sudden, who's gonna customize it? Who understands it? I want it to be as, and also it causes you to challenge the business processes that, that, are, that are there, right? My goal is to push the business to be as, as absolutely lean and efficient and limit redundancies as possible, right? So I, this, this really allows us to be like, well, do we need a customized solution or what's best practice? Like what's actually today best practice and then do we not need, can we get rid of all this other stuff? And if that's the case, then that's, that's perfect. Yeah, I think we found some sites are be changing kind of their data handling process a little bit out of this because of that. We're implementing best practice, um, but but yeah, we tried to kind of get that most routine, most out of the box kind of solution. I know you had a question. Yeah, a question. Oh, I don't think we have okay. time. Okay. I'll, okay. I'll, you can I'll, find I'll, us yeah, after. Yeah, we're sticking around. And um, we're gonna have some time at the end too. Okay. So we'll um, have our talk at least one. <laughs> <laughs> we'll oh well, we've got we've got a few minutes. We can answer. No, we can answer. We, let's answer a question. We've got a few minutes. Yeah. If people are coming in at the specified time for a specific time. Okay, we'll get you later. Uh, our next talk is called Big Data Wrangling and Staying on Script uh, by Stephanie Benucci. She is an environmental engineer at Environment Incorporated in Bozeman, Montana. She studied engineering physics at the Colorado School of Mines and has been working in mine water treatment since 2014. At Environment, she works as an engineering consultant focusing on biogeochemistry and the environmental impact of mined materials and mine affected water systems. Thanks, Denise. Let's see. All right, there we are. Hello, everyone. Uh, like mentioned, my name is Stephanie Benucci, and I'm with Environment in Bozeman, Montana. I work as an environmental engineer there. I'd like to give some credit to Katie Seipel, my coworker, who worked with me a lot on standardizing the process that I'm about to talk about. We're going to talk about big data wrangling and staying on script. I think so far we've heard of a variety of applications that can be applied at a variety of scales. And this is another tool that can be used to maybe an external organization that either gets data from PDFs or from large 
uh, databases that are exported from these big systematic implementations. We're going to talk about some of the programming languages that can be used to streamline and automate analysis. And I'm going to talk about that by giving an example of a geochemical characterization that we performed and the different ways that you can automate that analysis, uh, starting with process flow diagrams for your data process and cleaning, creating raw data frames that can then be used by many different applications, and writing scripts using logic diagrams to write your scripts and some tips on QAQC when you're automating the analysis. Data management, old versus new. There's a push towards innovation and automating these systems. And I think that while Excel is great in all its uses, it's also limited. And so recognizing some of those limitations, some of those human errors that come into play when we're using data frames all the time, copy-paste errors, calculation errors, clicking and dragging. We do a lot of things to the spreadsheets that we use to make them easily, visibly understood by humans. But when you take all that stuff away, the computer still understands it. And so you can make these really big data frames that using Excel and open source programming languages, free programming languages, you can keep all your data in one place and it can get so big that you don't have to use those human visual tools. You can use an open source programming language to automate that analysis without touching that data frame at all. And in that sense, you're also eliminating some of those copy paste errors. Let the robots do the work. Start with some definitions here that I'm using. We've already heard a lot of these terms, but talking about raw data, just without formatting, it's better for the computer, although it's sometimes harder to see for the human. Data frames, a structured table of this raw data, maybe consistent headers, consistent formatting we've talked about is really helpful for being able to do pattern recognition in these. A script, the sequence of instructions, the scripted analysis, the automated analysis that can be written in many different languages in many different programs. Um, open source is publicly accessible, uh, free for download on the internet. And a lot of times they also have associated teaching modules that are really helpful. A GUI, a graphical user interface, it's the part that you're interacting with. So some of these are more sophisticated. They may have buttons and colors. And when you're working with a computer program, say Microsoft Word, what you see, that graphical user interface, uh, has been added. It has been coded into it. But behind that, for example, in my next one I write, Microsoft Word was actually written in the language C. And so you could directly code into some of these programs, but they have these front end systems that make them easier to use. We've come a long way. There have been there are many, many different types of computer programs and computer languages. Uh, we started in this old system, this hole punching system. I always forget what it was called. Uh, but the code cards, where you'd have to code into these cards. And actually now, in the top right, we have the world's smallest computer. And it's actually not the square on that person's finger. It's one of the smaller squares. So we, we have a variety of different programs at our fingertips. And when we think about what program we would like to use, we want to think about who knows it and who's going to be reviewing it, whether that's an internal review or a regulatory agency, making sure that not only one person knows how to read that language. And you want to think about version control, version tracking requirements. Certain programs are better at capabilities, or at different capabilities, and also easier to review and track at different levels. Some more division of categories here, just explaining some of this terminology. Up here, I have a spectrum of open source versus closed source, and then graphical user interface versus no graphical user interface. And you can see there are some trademarked programs on the bottom right that you have to purchase. Some of them we may be more familiar with, but it's the program and then the language that it's written in. So you can start to see how some of these are related. The example I'm going to talk about for automating this analysis was a project that we worked on with Kinross Gold at their Bald Mountain Mine. We did a large geochemical characterization of their ore and waste rock for permitting packages. There were two permitting packages, uh, and it was the Bald Mountain Mine is just outside White Pine County, Nevada. 
we are trying to get all of this off the ground at once. And so that, mean we were, that means we were using enough data that we needed more sophisticated methods of analysis and we needed to automate this analysis in order to meet a timeline and maintain quality. 11 pits concurrently. Part of the scope was mining their historic data and that was something, let me tell you. <laughs> We had data from all different labs, from all different consultants, in all different forms, and we had to con combine all of it into a single data frame that then could be run through that automated analysis. So that's that big push in getting this off the ground, is getting it in a format that is consistent. A gap analysis, veri verifying the adequacy of the sampling program, and then finally evaluating the geochemical properties in the ore and waste that we were actually after. That was the automated analysis. This is what it looks like when you open up R Studio. It is a computer program that is written in R. This is what we selected for this automated analysis. And the top left, you can see where I've written some script. The purple is comment. I can write anything I'd like and it doesn't ask the computer to do anything in the purple writing. That's where I just make sure that I'm not crazy and add notes to myself. The Top right is some of my definitions. So I defined A and B, and I defined a list of A and B, and it shows me the output so that I can remember what the computer thinks A and B are equal to. The bottom right is an example, example of a figure output, so you can view some of the visuals that you're trying to create in real time. And the bottom left is the console. And that is the really important part. That's where you're interacting with the computer and asking it, hey, is is this really what I think it is? Will you show me the subset of this data? I'd like to see the mean of this data set and compare it to this one, but really quickly as a note, it's not hard-coded into the script of something I want to do every time. I'm just doing it to check myself to make sure that I'm on the right page and that I don't have any crazy outlier values or anything that I need to take a deeper look at. So that's where you can interface directly, quickly, real time. This is the process flow for the geochemical characterization that we performed. So we had about 260,000 samples that we were looking at for this project. And once they had all been cleaned, which as I mentioned, took some time, we, we created all these consistent headers and consistent flagging between all of them. Then they could be brought through the automated analysis performed in RStudio and we could export whatever we needed to export for the characterization. So we exported figures and tables, statistical analysis for internal review and calculations. And you could add formatting to all of that as well on the output. And that's what then can be reviewed by the senior geochemist to understand the true quality and nature of these materials. You can make these more sophisticated. We have a modeling program we're working on and we have lots of intermediate outputs and so you can talk about where they're saved and you can show the team this as a process to say, hey, this is how this project is working and if you need to look at this Excel file or this table or this figure, this is how it's outputted, this is where it's outputted, these are the documents that went into that output. Tidy data are all alike but untidy data are untidy in their own way. It's a revision off of Anna Karenina by Leo Tolstoy, but it feels really personal to my heart because <laughs> this is what I seem to experience whenever I'm trying to clean data sets. Um, I imagine that many people in this room have experienced trying to consolidate data from different labs and sometimes it can be very arduous. They have different reporting limits and different standards and different labels for just about everything. <laughs> And so you can automate that cleaning a lot of times when you recognize patterns and then sometimes it takes a manual review. Um, but when you have these large data sets, it's important that you do create these standards so that you can further automate your analysis and ensure consistency in your data. This one makes me happy to look at. This is a clean, raw data frame. It's got consistent headers. In this case, we have a drill hole over here on the left, and then we have different depths next to it. And this is an example of the multi-element database that we used as a type of test. And we kept the, datas, the data sets and the data frames separate by test just for our quicker review, but they didn't actually have to be. But what we did is we flagged each of the samples that had different tests associated with them 
in these columns. So HCT, MWP, XRD, humidity cell, meteoric water mobility procedure, and X-ray diffraction, acid base accounting. These are the different tests that were performed on the same material. And what we can ask the computer to do in our studio is say, hey, I actually, I want to look at that whole ID just from 100 to 200 feet. I'm going to ask the computer to pull up all the data associated with that specific interval, and it can show it to you. And I'm going to ask the computer to plot it, put it in a simplified table so that I can show it to a senior reviewer and say, hey, this is what this data looks like. Let's look at this subset specifically. And they're like, oh, no, I actually, I wanted to look at 100 feet down. And instead of rewriting the whole thing, I just changed the depth in my selection criteria and push control enter, and I've got 100 feet down. And so if you automate these analyses, then the iterative nature is really helpful because you're always asking more questions and you always want to look further into different angles. It makes it really easy. The bad. So this isn't too bad. It's actually just an example of an output uh, from a large database at the mine that they use. And the way that the database outputs raw data into Excel, it puts negative 99 and negative 9 and some of the NAs. And so you can see that, and you can see that it's a pattern. So you can just write in the script that's cleaning this. Anytime you see a negative 99, change it to this value. Anytime you see a negative 9, change it to this value. Um, on the left up here, there's all these columns that have all this extra labeling that you don't need. You can just say, hey, every time you open a file from this source, delete columns 1 through 12. I don't need to look at them. Or it might mess up the analysis when you're running it through your automated analysis. And if they're these consistent systematic um, differences in formatting, then you can also automate that change. The ugly. This is when it gets really tricky. This is when you have to really dig into the details. And it's hard when these data sets in this example, it wouldn't be too bad to clean, but if it's 260,000 samples, it can get really challenging to clean when there are colors without explanations. Uh, there are, there's no consistent header. They're trying to compare a few different test types and a few different rock types, and it looks like they've just kind of copied and pasted all their thoughts into one Excel spreadsheet, and then it, it became part of our review. Uh, there's merged cells, which is just never very fun because the computer doesn't know what you're trying to associate what with. Broken references are really tricky, especially if we can't go back and find those references somewhere. And this is an example of why it can be really tricky to do your calculations and your characterization within the, the place where your data is stored because you might lose it if you make a mistake. Consistency is king. We could separate that entire column at the hyphen or underscore if we had a consistent formatting. So that's a column that sometimes uses hyphens and sometimes uses underscores. And it seems really simple. It's not hard for us to interpret that they're the same. But when you ask a computer to then select certain samples, it's much better at doing it when it's consistent. So after you've cleaned your data and you start writing your scripts, a logic diagram is something that I use that's really helpful. I was taught this in college when I was learning a language. And basically, it just outlines the flow of your analysis. So you can see visually what the script is going to be doing. So we've got a start. You can make definitions. In this case, we were doing a gap analysis. So we wanted to see the adequacy of the samples that we had. And so we wanted to see in how many, in, in each pit, how many samples are there in each rock type, of each type? So we could say, I'm going to define a list of pits that I need from this huge data set that has many pits and many different rock types. I'm going to say for each list, or each pit in the list that I've selected, I want to subset and only take the samples in those pits. I then want to subset and say, each unique rock type is its own subset. Count those samples, save a table of the results, and it's going to go through this loop until it's gone through each pit in your list. Then merge all the tables and print it. And in this case, this is, would be the reviewable output that you could look at. And when it's this size, again, maybe you didn't need these sophisticated tools. But when it's really big, and then the mind says, oh, shoot, we actually sent you the wrong data set. Like, 800 of these samples aren't associated with that. And we're going to give you, like, 1,000 more of these samples. You don't have to do it again. It's already written. So you just push Control-Enter, and it will count and do your gap analysis again. And then they could look at this table and say, oh, well, there are, there are only two alluvium samples in the basin pit. We need some more alluvium samples. And you can actually utilize the output in that way. 
Then for characterization and automating some of your analysis, similar approach in the beginning, define your list of pits or rock types. For each pit in this list, subset by samples, subset by unique rock type, create a summary statistics table. There are many pre-programmed functions for analysis. Any standard statistical review a lot of times has an associated function with it in these programming languages, so you don't have to write the exact math of it all. It's worth checking all the exact math, but a lot of times it's created for you and it can be just called the name of that analysis. Maybe you wanna plot X versus Y for some of the parameters. And then you get to this part where you say, oh, for basin, I know I wanted to look at the subset by oxidation because that pit has a really unique chain and shale layer that I just really wanna examine farther. So then you say, for, for the basin pit, I want a subset by oxidation and run that entire analysis again. And then you can print and save. So you can automate this analysis so that you can go pit by pit if you'd like, or anytime something new comes up, a revision in the data, you don't have to redo the analysis from scratch. Quality control tools. So we have this output, but we wanna make sure that it's the right output. And I think that sometimes people get frustrated with because they weren't sure exactly how it was generated. So you can add these different tools in order to help your quality control. Always print more than just the output. I like to print the title of the data frame that was used in that analysis, the date, file path, intermediate steps sometimes, especially if you're checking calculations, that's really helpful to see the intermediate steps. The script user, so you know who ran that script and what they're intending to do with that analysis. And always print the end value. The number of times I've tried to run something and I get a figure that says that there are 12 pilot shale samples and then I get a table that says that it did a mean of 13, I'm like, oh no. <laughs> so you wanna know that end value and then you go back and you make sure that you're using the same subsets, especially when you're trying to do a comprehensive analysis. There are websites that help with, with this quality control. GitHub is one of those. And it's, it basically tracks your version control of your script. That way you can see how every change was made and you can include team members on that so they can see how every change was made and they can accept or reject changes to make sure everyone's on the same page. Another easy tool is just incorporating commenting in your scripts. Um, some of my coworkers don't code in these languages and so I'll add comments to say this is what I'm intending to analyze and this is the data that I wanted to use. They can open my script and look at my comments and make sure that it makes sense, that I'm doing what I was asked to do because although they might not know the language, they still need to be able to make sure that the vision is the same. In summary, we use, a, we use this scripted analysis for a geochemical characterization of ore and waste rock. Um, and we could do all these analyses concurrently. We could do all 11 pits at once. It included over 260,000 samples, which is not a very big number to computers, although it seems really big to us. And in the end, we have these clean raw data frames that can then be incorporated into anyone else's existing system. And so the clean raw data frames can be brought into the mom and pop shop and it can be brought into the big sophisticated integrated corporate structure. Those data frames are more easily read by a variety of programs. The scripts can be used again and again. My call to action is for clean raw data everywhere. <laughs> in one place that no human touches. <laughs> and then automated data management. We've worked hard to create these automated systems. We should put them to use um, for any type of study that we're doing and it'll allow for more efficiency with higher quality control. It's not quality versus quantity, it's quality and quantity and large projects simultaneously to utilize the data that we already have. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. So I sometimes kind of push back about using things that are open source. Are using things like our Caesars metadata analysis, and I think maybe it's just because people don't quite understand how it works if they haven't used it before. How do you think you can convince people that open source isn't bad because it's free? Oh, that's interesting. I mean, I think from the computer programming perspective, there's such a 
big push towards open source, that that's actually where the quality is. And unfortunately, in these little niche pigeonholed systems, they don't. It's such a rapidly changing environment where there are new updates to things all the time that I think you'd be limited if you weren't involved with that sharing process from the computer programming capability perspective. Um, and so I think I would just try to explain the capability. And I think if they're afraid of the security of their data, I think that's an entirely different conversation. Um, and so you could work towards implementing cybersecurity procedures, but the open source language is not, unless you share it, it's not going to sure. yeah, affect that. Thank you. Mm -hmm.